Hello everyone, we recently did a poll and we found out that Web3 is around and is the buzz in the market. Everyone is talking about it, everyone wants to know more about it. So here we are with this podcast. Vanshika, now that you are here, I hope that our audience is going to know a lot more about Web3. And from the very beginning, because Web3 is a buzz around and everybody is talking about it, but very few clearly know how it actually works. There are terms Web3, Web2.0 and different ones. If you want to make it clear to everyone. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, like, even though Web3 is taken as a term, like a buzzword, um, there is a lot of things happening in the current scenario. It goes down really on how the application differs from what's Web2 and what's Web3, right? So currently, if I have to state, we are in Web2 era. Like, we are still yet to... Uh, come back to like a whole web3 uh, space where you know internet is decentralized because your servers are not decentralized yet right so um, it's dependent on use case in web3 the decentralized finance the crypto space blockchain space that's something that's very powerful and uh, a lot of people are you know going from web2 space to web3 because of just this use case like how the transactions um, are changing the current environment we used to do like you know wire transfers internationally but now you have got crypto so you can do these transactions uh, regardless of where you are right so this is just like one of the use case that's there there is like around investment there is around a lot of returns and stuff like that okay that's great so we can say that now people are realizing that privacy is really much important and where the data is going and if it is decentralized is important and people are realizing that yeah security and decentralization are like really really important um and in web 2 if you see you know the very first uh, thing that i came across when i took an interview for someone else i got to know that you know our data is not really safe because the third party uses in multiple ways but in web 3 you get the control of your data right if you want to put your data out there which is why they call decentralized internet so if you want to put your data out there it's right that right now it's like on some blockchain or you know on some uh, block of that uh, chain and after that what would happen is that you can either put like a, a privacy which is like you know having your own metamask wallet and stuff like that it's, it's just completely dependent on the use case and more importantly how your data is being exchanged uh, and one Shika, we recently did a poll uh, in which we found out that there are many students who are wondering and who are, you know, they are keen to learn Web3. So if you want to tell us, like, what is the scope of Web3 for tech students? Well, um, see, I think there is a, a misconception in students, especially. They think that in order to get in Web3, you can just jump in Web3, which is not a true thing. Um, a lot of tech stack in terms of languages that you would be using in Web3 will come from Web2 itself. So if you are someone who is looking to like change or like you know, get started in Web3, get the basics of Web2 right. Like you know, learn JavaScript, learn TypeScript. You need to have um, knowledge around object-oriented programming because that is what you will be using if you um, get in Web3 and you start learning Solidity. So um, there are like different languages, of course, which you'll be using in Web3, like little bit, not too much, like two to three languages, uh, the way you are saving the data on the server and stuff like that. But um, the idea is that you become well-versed in the Web2 era, like Web2 technology, using the languages, and then you switch to Web3. So, well, people, listen up. As Vanshika is saying, you need to get your Web2 basics clear. You need to know how web development and the web is working then only you can go further and learn more of Web3. Once you are talking about the applications of Web3, we already know that uh, NFTs and blockchains are there. But including those, are there any new features that are what we can say the products are coming that are going to be based on Web3? Well, um, you did mention about the DeFi, decentralized finance. You have gaming, you have metaverse. See, these are like the, I would say, these are like the fields and the use cases will come out based on these fields, right? The best part about Web3 is that you could have multiple use cases uh, brought together in a decentralized application. So you could have like a metaverse where you are, let's say, you are building an education system. So people 
who don't want to go to classrooms they can actually come into an environment learn things together and then they are also getting nfts for learning uh, you know all these courses so nfts as tickets nfts as certificates uh, because you can verify it on chain there are a lot of use cases it's it's like how you want to um, get into that uh, line and then you can find out whatever that makes you feel interested Varshikar, as you are working closely uh, with Web3 components, so can you tell us about any of the project that you have been working on so that we can, give, uh, we can get a closer look? Sure. Um, so as I work at Biconvi, of course, Biconvi SDK has been definitely close to my heart. Um, you know, I when I joined the company, we were just beginning off with the account abstraction, like we were just getting the SDK live on testnet. But right now, we are getting live on mainnet. So it's very interesting to see um, our SDK being used across a lot of developer space and people, you know, integrating it on different apps. Uh, apart from that, um, I think that there are other SDKs also that you can give a look. There is Third Web, um, there is Alchemy, um, and yeah, I mean, like these these are like the more developer focused um, SDKs. There is. Uh, another one around communication protocol, which is XMTP. So I'm looking at uh, that project as well. It's pretty interesting. That's great. Um, the SDKs, in which way they are helping the developers, if we are talking about Web3? Well, um, every SDK has got its own usage, right? Uh, I will start off from how Web2 and Web3 are different in collaborative space. In Web2, if you see you've got open source um, and people you know, collaborate on a single project or they use an open source project for a different purpose in their own application. In Web3, most of these projects, if you see, they will have something on-chain, which is like visible, completely visible to the um, users, to the developers. So the idea around the SDK is to make your uh, dApps being built much more easier. So like, like, let's say if you want to build something around account abstraction, which is like the highlight of this year, 2023, then you can use Biconme SDK and all you need to do is like import the packages and build the stuff around it, right? Similarly, if you want to do something around communication protocol, you will choose an SDK appropriate to that. So all these SDKs are there to help you out, especially the builders and the developers. And even the uh, projects that who would, which would like to integrate like on the main net, they can also use these. So Vanshika, we should really thank you and Biconomy for creating such SDKs which are making working on Web3 easier. Uh, well, there is one term dApp or we can say decentralized applications on Web3 going around. Uh, do you want to say something on that? Sure. I mean, um, see, I think I did use this word earlier also. Uh, in Web2, you have applications, you have got apps you install from Play Store. But what happens in Web3, because we call it decentralized internet, we call these applications also decentralized. Now, how decentralized and why decentralized is because it lives on chain, okay? Um, most of this will be either on Polygon or maybe Ethereum. So when you are, um, you know, you are building a decentralized application, you need to uh, first check it on testnet, you check that, you know, it's working properly, and then you push it live on the mainnet. And that makes it decentralized because all the transactions that will be going through that application will be verifiable on the block explorer. All right, so there is no centralized system. It is completely decentralized application. As we are moving uh, ahead with Web3 and uh, the economy is also changing. So when we are using the cryptocurrencies, what is the point of taxation in it? And how does it, like how it is going to work in future? What is your view on that? So I think there are two parts to this question. The first one is like how we are using crypto and why crypto in Web3. And the second thing is the taxation. So um, crypto here acts like, you know, uh, let's say, uh, let's go, to, we'll, we'll compare two applications, okay? One is gonna be a web two application and the second one is gonna be decentralized application. You must have seen that in Netflix um, and other platforms, Amazon Prime, you do, uh, you know, you buy uh, the subscription and you pay for it in your like currency in IRR, right? But what happens in decentralized applications, you cannot exactly use these currencies. So in terms of that currency, what you can use is the cryptocurrency. And uh, this cryptocurrency is actually worth of the INR or whatever currency that you have in your own country. It would be worth that much. And then you can pay it on the decentralized applications to buy things or um, you know to have subscriptions 
uh, we are still like working on that subscription model because I don't think there is any decentralized application working on it. But yeah, we, there there are uh, you know wallets which allow you to buy uh, crypto from your amount like in INR and then you can use it in the same uh, DAP. So that's like something around account abstraction as well where you can do fiat on ramp and off ramp and you can also do the transactions normally. And just coming to the second point around taxes, this is my opinion. We have 30% taxes right now, which is good in order to regulate the way uh, people were doing transactions earlier because you know you can always uh, exchange your money in terms of crypto, which cannot be seen by the bank. But then if you see the middle class people, if they are building anything in India, it's really difficult for them to build, which is why I think, um, you know, places like Dubai, they started working on the model where, you know, people can just come in and build things around Web3. So, um, I mean, it's good to have taxes in order to regulate in, uh, in our country, in India. But I also feel that, you know, you should have like a slab instead of just doing 30% tax, taxation imposed because not everyone is going to have that much of profit that they are able to pay taxes. Um, and a lot of times now what people are doing is that people have got remote jobs in India and they're working for some company outside. They prefer doing transactions in crypto. So if you see every time a person receives salary in crypto, they would have to pay, uh, you know, 1% TDS and then 30% tax on it. So that person is going to really suffer a loss in terms of getting salary. Uh, based on these circumstances, I feel that there should be a slab defined for people. Uh, and based on if they are earning their income, especially as a remote worker, then they should have like a different um, approach to it. I also believe that uh, this could be a hurdle in terms of a person transacting individually because 30% is a heavy tax, we can say that, right? Yeah. But also if what I believe like if a company is coming to India for doing business and seeing that it is uh, the crypto is heavily taxable they might think twice right Vanshika uh, you just said that countries like Dubai are promoting it and that is why people are coming there to work on crypto so uh, I'd like to know more about how the environment is there for crypto and how they are working differently uh, well I was in Dubai for like uh, a week or so uh, because uh, you know our headquarters happens to be in Dubai uh, and I was part of this conference called Eid Dubai. So I met like my fellow friends from Twitter um, and they have shifted from India to um, you know Dubai for this specific purpose. I think there are two things to look at. Number one is the way, um, you know, when people actually go to Dubai and they start their business, you of course get the visa for two years and like depending on like what kind of business you're doing. So that visa thing is very easy to obtain. The second thing is that they don't have like taxes and like very strict law against uh, crypto right like here uh, we had so many um, you know problems around adopting crypto but in Dubai if you see people are very fast with it they are quick with it they understand that it's a technology which is going to make the transactions easy for them um, more decentralized which is not right now in India there is like a lot of lack I personally feel in the knowledge um, in the knowledge space, uh, people don't get the difference between uh, doing heavy transactions uh, on like multiple platforms and the main importance of having a blockchain technology. It can be used for so many purposes, but I think um, there is like a little bit, um, you know, mindset around uh, crypto as, as a wrong uh, action. Yes, I also hope that uh, perspective of people here should change a little and should modify it so that it is for betterment for everyone. Uh, and before we move to the end of this podcast, uh, Varshika, would you like to uh, address the audience and say something more? So yes, definitely. I have something very personal to share. As I don't come from a like you know particular technical background, um, and my journey has been very different from the rest of the folks. Um, the first thing I want to say is that there is no particular roadmap to become what you actually want to, right? Like you feel that um, software engineering or becoming a product manager excites you. There is no roadmap for it until and unless you start exploring what's around you, um, you wouldn't find the right path for it. And trust me, everyone has got his own different journey. If you don't get your own journey, then it will become just similar like others, right? 
So I remember when two years back, um, I was trying to get into the space of open source and then eventually Web3, I used to ask a lot of people this question. But there was this one difference which made me realize that um, not everyone can come up and solve my problem, which is I come from a different background and they have a different learning and understanding of things. But I did seek mentorship from people. I did try to learn from their experiences. So instead of asking, um, you know, a particular roadmap or like, you know, resources, try to find mentors in the space, connect with them, try to learn from their experiences so you can avoid the mistakes they might have done in their life. And another thing about Web3 particularly, I know it is a hype and so many of you want to get into that space, but um, try out what you actually like building in Web2 maybe and then shift to Web3 because trust me, Web3 is really big and it might take more time than you might have thought to get into it. So with that being said, um, keep building, keep learning and that learning cycle should never end no matter where and what you become. So keep keep doing what you want to. Well, that's really good and inspiring to hear Vanshika. And people, as she said, keep on exploring. And if you are a college student, make connections that are going to work, that are going to help find out mentors who are going to clear, give you a clear path. And Vanshika, just thank- to add one thing, just to add one thing, um, people think connections is about uh, you know sending requests on LinkedIn. Um, my LinkedIn happens to be much more less active as compared to how I am on Twitter, and it's because of the uh, you know the the way you want to put yourself out. So make a brand around yourself also. And when I say build connection, make like good one on one connections, which you know you can seek something good from them because LinkedIn connections they might or might not reap what you are looking for. So that's one thing. Do create accounts on LinkedIn, but just don't depend on it completely. Build connections or who are going to work with you, who are going to at least communicate with you, not just numbers, yeah. right? And well, thank you so much, Vanshika, for taking out time and uh, uh, having this podcast with us. I hope everybody and everyone in the audience are learning something from it, and it is going to give them a clear vision and path. Thank you so much, Vanshika, for being with us here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great week. Bye.